It's been a little while, but welcome back to my series on the Fujaira Blitz Tournament. This is going to be round six. Let's get into it. For this game, I was playing a player by the name of Dilshad Mohammed from India. And we had a friendly chat before the game. He was telling me that he visited the World Championship match in New York in 2016 and actually played in the Marshall Chess Club. I also happen to be at that same tournament. So it's possible we crossed paths years ago, I guess about eight years ago. But uh, here we are meeting across from each other in round six of the Fujai Blitz tournament. And coming into this game, I really wanted to win. Uh, I did lose a tough one in the previous round against Grandmaster Arinsabia. So uh, again, if you want to watch my previous rounds, you can click the playlist below. So there is a little bit of waiting before the game, but eventually the round does start. We shake hands and I opt for my favorite London opening. And we both blitz out our opening preparation. He goes for a very common line with e6 and bishop d6. I'm still in my prep, go for this trendy 95 line. And we both keep blitzing until I play this move pawn h4. And this is a moment that he leans forward and starts to think, maybe taking things a bit more seriously now. Uh, plays a very natural bishop to b7, and I play bishop to d3. So I'm going for a line which I play a lot in online blitz. This is a, a bit more modern way of playing the London, where white doesn't castle kingside, uh, but rather tries to prepare the kingside attack with this early h-pawn push. And when he took on d4, I took a small pause because both recaptures are possible, debating whether to take with c or e-pawn. But I take with the, the c-pawn to keep my bishop on f4 defended. And then he pretty quickly plays knight to e4. And this is uh, already a pretty complex position because there's a lot going on in the center basically a, a blob of pieces between our knights on e5 and e4, tension between the bishops, and there's a lot of moves for me to consider here. Uh, I was debating whether I should take the knight on e4, but I was also considering possibilities of bringing my queen in to try and attack on the king side. Uh, queen f3, queen g4, or even queen h5 are all possible. So. Yeah, this is my first extended think of the game. And I was really just trying to determine what gives me the best attacking potential going into the middle game. And I knew that I probably don't want to castle kingside, especially given that I've committed to h4. So after a bit of thinking, I decide to play pawn h5. This is one of the points of having played h4. I just want to keep pushing my h-pawn and ideally create some weakness in black's position. Uh, h6 is now in the air, and um, yeah, I'm really just gaining space on the king side. So now he starts taking his time, and black does have options here. Now, one of the benefits for him, having just played knight to e4, is he has the possibility of playing f6 to try and kick away my knight from e5 and induce some trades. And he does end up playing pawn f6. Now, one of the reasons I had played h5 on the last move is to set up my next move, knight to g6. And this is a really fancy idea because I'm sacrificing the knight, but if black dares to capture the knight, then I'm going to have a lot of counterplay on the, the h file. So he opts for rook to e8, simply saving his rook and leaving my knight attacked by his pawn on h7. And now it's a weird position because it seems like I should really have something on the king side. My knight is on g6, my pawn is on h5, but I found it difficult to actually uh, find any attacking ideas. And I end up trading bishops on d6. And my knight is still just chilling in black's territory. And I was debating here whether I need to move my knight back. I could play the move knight f4 now that my bishop is not occupying that square. But I thought that black is not really threatening 
to capture the knights because I'll have a lot of counterplay on the H file. And after the game, I can show uh, the more specific lines where uh, black takes the knight and then gets punished. But here I'm, uh, I'm just trying to figure out what to do in the position. And part of my thought process was asking, what does black want to do here? And I identified that black has some idea of playing queen to b4, which is actually an annoying move to pressure my queen side, pin my knight on d2. So I ended up playing a3, which is kind of slow, but it's a prophylactic move to prevent queen b4, try and keep control in the position. So obviously not the most aggressive move. And he completes development with knight to d7. And at this point, I'm not really thinking about moving my knight back from g6. Last few moves, he did not want to take it. So I really wanted to get my attack going. And I play queen to g4. I didn't play this last move because of the idea of queen b4. So I figured that, uh, yeah, things are looking nice now. I'm trying to build up pressure on the king side. I also now have three attackers against the knight on e4 between my bishop, my knight, and my queen. So he takes a pause here, trying to figure out what to do. One option for black would be to take the knight on d2, after which I'd have to take back with my king. But I wasn't really scared of that variation because my king would be pretty safe in the center, given the center files are closed. But to my surprise, he takes my knight on g6 and then plays king f8. So basically trying to call my bluff that my knight was uh, just a hanging piece. And now he's trying to escape with his king via e7 and run to the queen side as quickly as possible. So I was not expecting him to go for this. And I tried to seize the opportunity uh, to invade with rook to h7. And this is a nice move, not only optimizing the rook, but it's basically preventing him from playing king e7 because now the king is tied down to defending the g-pawn. So at this point, I'm feeling good. Uh, seems like I have a lot of compensation for having sacrificed the knight with my g-pawn and my rook very deep in black's position. But then he plays a very resourceful move, pawn f5. And there's a lot of purposes behind this move. Not only is he attacking my queen and reinforcing his knight on e4, but he's also freeing the f6 square for one of his knights. And I realized that, uh, yeah, after he plays his move, my attacking chances are not so clear in the position. We can see by the eval bar that white's still for choice, according to Stockfish, but I didn't see a clear way of keeping the pressure, especially given that knight f6 is going to hit the rook next move. And then if my rook is chased away from h7, then his king is going to be ready to run. And I really have to prove any sort of compensation for being down a piece. So I fidget a little bit in my chair and I do fall below a minute on the clock is trying to figure out what to do. Uh, the natural moves are queen h4, queen h3, but wasn't sure what to do after knight f6. So I first take the knight on e4, and this turns out to be a pretty big mistake, which I will show why after the game. When I take his knight, uh, of course, if he takes my queen, I'd be happy to take his queen, but he just takes back on e4 with his d-pawn. Now my queen's attacked. And my bishop is attacked. Of course, I have to save my queen. I move over to h4. And with this move, I am threatening checkmate in one. My queen is now controlling the getaway square for his king on e7. But uh, yeah, black has a pretty simple move here. Now, I was actually surprised that he didn't play his next move a bit more quickly, because there's not too many ways for black to stop the checkmate in one. But eventually he does play knight f6. I quickly play bishop b5, trying to keep the initiative, trying to keep the threats coming. I'm attacking his rook on e8 and trying not to give him time to take my rook on h7. Uh, if he were to take my rook, I'd be happy to 
uh, take back with a pawn and then threaten to queen while still attacking his rook on e8. So he pauses here, trying to figure out how to deal with the threat. And he plays bishop c6, which is a very simple, solid move, just offering the trade of bishops, leaving my rook attacked on h7. And now I'm falling dangerously low on time, uh, around the 30 second mark, down about a minute on the clock, and my time just ticks lower as I realize that I have very little compensation for the sacrifice piece. Now we do have a 3 second increment, so I was not concerned about flagging here, but I fall below 10 seconds, I deliver the check on h8, uh, maybe hoping he would play knight to g8 so I can come in with a queen, but uh, he wisely plays king to e7, we trade rooks on e8, and uh, I drop back my bishop to e2, and my whole attack has pretty much failed, I had to retreat the bishop, his king is very safe on e7, but the game is still alive, and I still had some optimism here, especially because I've kept my pawn on g6 alive, and he's also getting low on time. Now he plays rook c8, I play rook c1, trying to at least fight for one of the only open files on the board. And one thing about this position is... With queen still on the board, there is a lot of hope left for white, and I really wanted to keep as much tension as possible. Now he plays queen d8, and I play pawn g4, and this is uh, one of my only logical pawn breaks in the position, trying to break down his seemingly solid structure in the center. He takes on g4, and I recapture with the bishop. So now his double e pawns are isolated on the e file. My light square bishop, of course, pressuring the pawn on e6. He plays bishop d7, very safe, solid move, offering the trade of rooks on the c file. Now, I really didn't want to trade rooks, but I didn't see a better option. I take on c8 and play king to d2, preventing his queen from infiltrating via c2 or c1. But uh, yeah, with every trade, it really just helps black clarify the position. And now he's getting low on time, falling below 10 seconds, and now it's turning into a bullet OTB game. He plays queen e8, attacking my pawn on g6. I play queen g5, defending. He plays king f8, unpinning his knight, attacking my bishop. I draw back to e2 with the bishop. He returns to e7 with his king. And now I'm trying to keep the pressure. Fall below five seconds here. I play pawn f3. We trade pawns. And then he plays queen h8, trying to invade via the h file. I play e4, threatening to play pawn e5. But then he plays a very strong move, queen h6, pinning my queen, forcing the queen trade. I barely get to play queen e3. And after we trade queens, he plays bishop to e8, attacking my very weak pawn on g6 and I end up flagging in what was a heartbreaking loss. He just defended well, and the final position was losing. What to do? Kudos to my opponent for uh, playing a, a very good game. So let's hop into the analysis. And starting with the opening, I think everything went smoothly. I got to play some nice London preparation. And for anyone that plays a London and finds themselves in this position, uh, very often like bishop g3 is the main line to keep the tension between the bishops. But uh, knight e5 is a line I discovered within the last couple of years. And I think it's a, a more aggressive approach for white to not lose a tempo moving the bishop, but rather to improve the knight, open the queen. And as we saw in this game, it can lead to some early attacks. So going forward, basically all of this was opening preparation through h4 and bishop d3. And after pawn takes pawn, uh, yeah, both recaptures were possible. Um, e takes is sometimes a little bit more natural in the London to uh, make the e file half open and allow queen e2 to support the knight. But I took with the c pawn just to make sure my bishop is defended, my knight's not actually pinned to the bishop. 
And going forward from here, uh, yeah, this is all, I think, the proper way to play for white, uh, including knight g6 this is a top engine move. And just to show if black takes the knight in this position, then it's just winning for white because uh, white is threatening forced checkmate. For example, let's say black plays a move like knight takes d2. This is checkmate in three after rook h8, king takes h8, queen h5, king g8, queen h7. Very typical mating pattern. And even in this position, like what else for black to do? If the king tries to run, white can still go for rook h8 and take and queen h5. And this is also a nice mating sequence. Queen takes g7, checkmate in the end. So my knight was poisonous, at least for the move after I played knight g6. And my opponent responded correctly with rook e8. And after takes, takes. Uh, yeah, I did take time here to play pawn a3. Uh, the engine says I should have retreated the knight, but I didn't go for this in the game because pawn e5 looked a little bit troublesome. Uh, however, this would not have been a problem because I actually have the move knight takes e4, and after pawn takes e4, there's queen b3 check. And then there's a really nice mating sequence here. Uh, we should note that black can't really block the check with the bishop because knight takes d5, can't block on e6 as well. And if king h8, it's white to move maiden 2. There's knight g6, pawn takes, and pawn takes g6 checkmate, unleashing the rook. Uh, so the king would have to move to f8, but white's in full control here uh, after knight g6, still sacrifice the knight, and then white's threatening queen f7, rook h8 on top. White's in, uh, in very, very good shape. So maybe I should have played knight to f4, but I thought it'd be cool to just keep the knight on g6. And the engine says that a3 is one of the top moves. So after knight to d7, uh, I play queen to g4, and this is still a playable move. And it turns out that after my opponent took the knight, it's very fine for white, but I would have had to follow up precisely. Now let's get to the key moment. After he plays king to f8, I played rook h7, he plays f5. It was in this position that I took a lot of time and I thought that my attack is just dissipating. My queen's attacked, his knight's coming to f6. But what I should have realized is it's so important to keep my knight on the board. When he plays f5, yes, it has benefits for black, but it also has some concessions. The fact that he's giving me some control over these squares on e5 and g5, it should have made me realize that I should keep the knight to play knight f3 later to access these squares. And of course, in the game, I made a terrible move trading off my knight, and then black was in full control. Uh, what I should have done was play queen h4, and I was calculating this move and just didn't see what to do after knight to f6 attacking my rook. I was calculating rook h8 and king e7, and this would be very fine for black. But what I missed was I can just leave my rook on h7 and very simply play knight f3. And it turns out that my rook is untakeable in this position because if black does take it, I would take back with the pawn, threatening to queen. He can't run with king e7, I'm controlling that square. And if he plays king f7, which I think I was like vaguely calculating that, okay, the, the two rooks are gonna stop me from queening. I just miss the fact that my knight is coming in to e5, and this is completely winning for white. If the king moves back, I queen with checkmate. Meanwhile, yeah, queen takes e5, white is gonna be on a pretty clean road to winning the game. So this was a big mischance that I could have left the rook on h7, I could have brought my knight in, and white still has a really nice grip in the position, especially given the fact the king is still tied down to g7. It's not easy for black to defend g7 because any piece coming to e7 would walk into rook h8. So uh, yeah, it's not winning for white, like the game would go on, but White does have full compensation for the piece in this variation. So what happened in the game when I took on e4? This gave away 
any chance of having a strong attack. And I do want to give kudos to my opponent for playing very cleanly from here. Uh, he just defended really well, played really solidly, and even even though I got some practical chances when I played pawn g4, and uh, we traded on g4, there was really no hope for me. And even yeah, towards the end, he came up with this nice move, queen h6, and all hope was pretty much lost for white. Uh, if I didn't flag in this position, I was going to lose a pawn, the knight's preventing bishop h5, and this would have been a pretty routine winning endgame for black. So definitely some lessons to take away from this game. Hope you guys enjoyed the content. Uh, do stay tuned for round seven. As always, if you like the content, do subscribe. It does help the channel. And I'll see you guys soon.